Greetings. This is the great one himself, Cynical Libertarian Society founder, C Y N L I B S O C dot com. Having a little anarchy moment here this morning, drinking my coffee, waiting for Windows 7 to finish disk checking. While I'm doing that, I want to read a passage and talk a little bit about this book, to take this book back to the library tomorrow. I haven't even gotten around to reading it yet because I'm bad about that. But I intend to read it. It looks really good. The book is called To Save Everything, Click Here, The Folly of Technological Solutionism. And it is written by somebody whose name I don't have a chance in hell of pronouncing correctly. E-V-G-E-N-Y is the first name. The second name is M-O-R-O-Z-O-V. I'm not even going to fuck up this person's name by trying to pronounce those words. Because that would just be an embarrassment. Meanwhile, for the last hour, and I think it's finally stopped, there's been a car alarm going off. And when I say for the last hour, you may think I'm exaggerating and I'm not. What is it with you people in car alarms? Car alarms are so 1980. I mean, when they first came out, yeah, they were cool and you were cool because, oh, look, my car alarms if you touch it. People, can we, we please fucking stop at the car alarms? Nobody pays attention to them. Nobody gives a fuck. What's really funny is as I was bicycling past the car that the lights were flashing and the alarm was going off, the next block over there's a cop car sitting there with the cop sitting there looking at his computer playing solitaire, getting ready to probably run me over if I'm on the sidewalk. That's an inside joke if you live in Fort Collins about getting run over on the sidewalk by police officers when you're riding your bike. Anyhow, none of this has anything to do with the book. And leaf blowers. I'm really fucking sick of people and their fucking leaf blowers. I'm becoming convinced that leaf blowers are some kind of penis substitute. And if you why do people who believe in global warming use leaf blowers? Because the leaf blower is contributing to global warming. Why don't you use a fucking rake or a broom? And I did mention, I mentioned before the other day, somebody was out here outside my apartment complex with a leaf blower blowing off the fucking rocks. Because God forbid, the rocks. Rocks. Okay, it's xenoscaping. It's rocks. Because the rocks may have had some dirt on them. It's not fall. There's no leaves. What the fuck is wrong with you people? None of this has anything to do with the book. To save everything, click here. The Folly of Technological Solutionism. All right, let me read this passage. And I just did the commentary about the guy on the bicycle where he pled guilty to vehicular manslaughter, Right, because they had his GPS data clocking him at 30 miles an hour and he was dumb enough to go onto the internet, onto a Google message board and post on there that he deliberately ran his bike into a group of human beings. Okay, so you people aren't very smart to begin with. The pauses are me drinking coffee in an attempt to regain consciousness because I slept not worth a shit last night either. Laid in bed for like three hours, unable to go back to sleep. It was not good. Now, the book. Finally, we're four minutes in. We're going to get to the fucking point now. I feel like a bad Quaker podcast. Now that I've talked for 27 minutes about things that are not on my notes, I'm going to get to my notes. All right, here we go. This is a, this is a couple of pages worth of stuff, so just fucking fasten your seatbelt. We'll see how my reading skills are on one and a half cups of coffee. This is from the chapter, Less Crime and More Punishment. I'm reading on page 204, if you actually happen to have the book and want to reference this. Okay. Of course, another important challenge... Ugh, already screwing up. Of course, another important channel for challenging the law is civil disobedience. And let me also say, see, I'm, this is not me reading... I find it refreshing that this guy is talking about challenging the law and civil disobedience because I've been reading and I talk about them many books about this same similar thing about how the internet can be used against you, how technology can be used against you, how the invasion of your privacy, books like Database Nation, which came out years and years ago and foretold onto this stuff, and the You Are Not a Gadget and the other one by the same guy, I just had it, I can't remember the name of the book now. And the thing about most of these books, I don't want to say all of them, but most of these books is in the end, they all reach the same conclusions. That the thing which is going to save us from invasive technology is always the government. 
it's always statism. It's always, well, we just need more laws, right? Because right now we have to stop Google from reading your email. So we need more laws to prevent Google from reading your email. You know, never mind that the government reads all of your email. Never mind that the post office makes uh, photographic images of all the mail that is delivered to you. I've covered that. If you don't believe me, not tinfoil hat, go fucking look it up. You have Google, right? You're the smartest generation ever. Fucking Google for it until the government tells Google to remove it from their database. But the solution is always in these books. It's always more laws, more regulations, more government. That that's what's going to stop the evil corporations and the government from spying on the citizens is more laws because that's ever fucking worked in the past. So it's nice to read something in this book where the person is talking about civil disobedience and challenging the law because most of these books are all about kissing the government's ass. Not to say that that's a theme through this book. I don't know because I haven't read the whole book. This again, this is, I just randomly opened it up to this page and read this and thought it was brilliant. And so I bookmarked it and that's why we're doing this. I have not read anything before this or anything after this. This is completely just off the cuff. All right. Let me go back to reading now that we're seven minutes into the podcast. Of course, another important channel for challenging the law is civil disobedience. And yet, in a world where law-breaking is impossible, no civil disobedience can take place, for the system provides no means of violating the law, regardless of the lawbreaker's reasons for doing so. This is a problem, for as many philosophers and legal theorists have argued, it's not so far-fetched to believe that we do have a right to civil disobedience. Ronald Dworkin for example, has argued that this right derives from all the other rights we have to challenge the government. Thus, whenever a law violates a right that is important to our dignity or some other personal value of consequence, say freedom of expression, we have a right to disobey it. Considerations of utility are irrelevant here and expected futility of our protest doesn't deprive us of this right. Note from me, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this Dworkin guy's name correctly or not, Ronald Dworkin, D-W-O-R-K-I-N. For Dworkin, there is also a great signaling value to civil disobedience as it can indicate that the law in question doesn't correspond to common belief or morality, which is one reason why we should investigate whether our smart digital environments make resistance easier or harder to practice. Would opponents of the Vietnam War have accumulated as much symbolic capital if the draft cards they burned in violation of federal law were made from fireproof material? Or take what is perhaps the most symbolic act of civil disobedience in the 20th century, Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat and move to the back of the bus with the other black riders. This courageous act was possible because the bus and the socio-technological system in which it operated were terribly inefficient. The bus driver asked Parks to move only because he couldn't anticipate how many people would need to be seated in the white-only section at the front. As the bus got full, the driver had to adjust the sections in real time, and Parks happened to be sitting in an area that suddenly became white-only. Now, this is not me reading. This is me interjecting something. And I have spot read some other things in this book. And the interesting thing about this book is all of those of you who are in the medicated generation and those of you who have Google's nutsack in your mouth and Steve Jobs' nutsack in your mouth and Obama's cock in your mouth, you know, all of you have this very mistaken belief that the internet and technology is somehow going to prevent tyranny, that it will prevent oppressive governments, that it is liberating, that the internet and technology leads to more freedom. And from what I can glean from this book, from the areas I've spot read, the author of this book is presenting the opposite thesis, and he makes some very good cases. He's about to make one here, and there are some other ones in here that I've read. And his point is that, no, the technology and the internet makes it easier for oppressive regimes to oppress freedom. And 
there, I can think of lots of ways that this is obvious. One of the most obvious is in, you know, with Google, with everybody using Google, with Google controlling search results, let's say a movement is started for the South to succeed, secede from the United States again. Okay, the government doesn't like this. The government goes to Google and says, look, hey, Google, we want you to make sure that search results for Southern secession don't show up on Google. And if they keep showing up, we may have to audit your income tax returns. I mean, it's that simple. The idea that, because think about, and think about when you use the internet. Most people use the internet through search engines, right? You're looking for something, what do you do? You type it into a search engine. You take the, as study after study has shown, you take the first thing that Google pops up. Or if you're old, like my mother, who used Bing. <laughs> Bing, oh, that's funny. You use Bing and you type something into Bing and you take the first thing that shows up. So by controlling the search engines, and this is just one way, who, he who controls the search engines controls what information is actually disseminated. Somebody also mentioned to me that apparently, and I, I haven't researched this at all, I have no clue what happened, so this is just purely something said to me offhand, may or may not be true, I need to investigate it. But somebody was saying, and I think it was the Amazon Kindle, I could be wrong about that too, but somehow or another a book went onto the Amazon Kindle and then something happened and nobody in this group who was discussing this was actually clear about what happened. But something happened and so Amazon, if it was Amazon, pulled this book off of everybody's Kindle just without asking it, just boom, it was gone. And it's like in 1984 where these people spent all of their time Right, revising the news. The beautiful thing about technology and the internet is that revising the news takes almost no effort or work whatsoever. Right? When the government decides to lie about something, they don't have to go. This is why books are superior. I know that the medicated generation doesn't believe this and nobody cares what you think because you're stupid. But this is why books are superior. And I've talked about this before. Once a book is written, like this book right here in my hand, right? The government could go to this guy whose name I can't pronounce and tell him, you know how you wrote that book? You need to go through and you need to change some of the stuff in here or we're going to audit your income taxes because we don't like what you're saying. If this book is on digital format, those changes can be made and the digital book that you've purchased will be changed via the internet automatically. You'll never know the difference. With a hard copy book, I've got this right here. Well, actually, I don't, it's the library's book. The library has, if you buy the book, you have it. It cannot, nobody can come in your house at night via the internet and change the contents of the book. Everybody thinks the internet is this wonderful way to disseminate information. It's not. The internet is a wonderful way to control information. It's a way to limit what people are exposed to, right? The internet doesn't work like a library. I go to the library and I just walk around and look at the shelves, look at the shelves, look at the books that are on the shelves and discover things. You can't really do that on the internet. People, you can get on the internet and surf the web. Nobody does that. Nobody gets on a website and reads things and then clicks on a hyperlink and reads that and clicks on a hyperlink and reads that. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Nobody does that anymore. When's the last time you ever read an entire fucking article like on some piece of shit like the Huffington Post or Wikipedia or whatever? So you're reading on Wikipedia. When's the last time you found the reference, followed the link to the reference, read the reference? And then in the reference to the Wikipedia article, clicked on a link and went to something else in that reference material and read that. When's the last time you've ever done that? For most of you, the answer is never. Okay, the internet does not disseminate information. The internet controls information. And the reason you're not smart enough to understand that is because you're learning the things you're learning from the internet. You cannot see the flaws of the system because you're in the system. I'm also reading a really great book right now called Being Wrong, which is about being wrong. And in there she makes this great point and I think she stole this from somebody else. And that's fine because I'm stealing it from them. But the expression is you can't be wrong and know you're wrong at the same time. Because if you know you're wrong, you're gonna stop being wrong. And this is the problem with the internet. People using the internet can't see the internet as flawed because they're using the internet. In order to see the flaws of the internet, you have to, number one, stop using the internet 
And I don't mean permanently stop using it, but I mean you have to walk away from the internet and then you have to have something to compare it to and reference it to. Like for example, books or something. But since the medicated generation has no concept of a book other than on their iPad, they, they you people just don't fucking get this. All right, speaking of books, now that we're 16 minutes into the podcast, I'm going to go back to finishing reading this segment. So remember, we're talking about Rosa Parks on the bus. You know, three or four hours ago when I was actually reading this. All right, here we go. Now, imagine that Parks is riding one of the smart buses of the near future. Equipped with sensors that know how many passengers are waiting at the nearest stop, the bus can calculate the exact number of African Americans it can transport without triggering conflict. Those passengers who won't be able to board or find a seat are sent polite text messages informing them of future pickups. A smart facial recognition scheme provided by video cameras at bus stops keeps count of how many people of each race are waiting to board and divides the bus into two white and black sections accordingly. The bus driver, if there still is one, can tap into the big data computer portal that, much like predictive software for police, produces historical estimates of how many black people are likely to be riding that day and calculates the odds of racial tension based on weather, what's in the news, and the social networking profiles of specific people at the bus stop. Those passengers most likely to cause tension on board are simply denied entry. Will this new transportation system be convenient? Sure. Will it give us Rosa Parks? Probably not, because she would never have gotten to the front of the bus to begin with. The odds are that a perfect, efficient seat distribution system abetted by a big ubiquitous, I can almost say the word, ubiquitous, four four times. (laughs) Can we get it a fifth time? Abetted by ubiquitous technology, sensors, and facial recognition would have robbed us of one of the proudest moments in American history. Laws that are enforced by appealing to our moral or prudential registers leave just enough space for friction. Friction Friction breeds tension. Tension creates conflict, and conflict produces change. In contrast, when laws are enforced through technological register, there's little space for friction and tension, and quite likely for change. And this is completely true. I mean, as you people use the technology to make your life easier, what people are also doing is making it less likely for there to be conflict and tension in society. Without those things, everybody thinks the internet is leading to these great changes and technological progress, and it's not. The internet enhances conformity. Technology enhances conformity. Conformity is not conducive to change and progress, right? As the technology becomes more and more invasive, for example, I was just reading about how going to football stadiums now, you have to be searched and you can't take all these things in anymore and you have to have bags that are transparent and all these. So who are the people that are still going to go to football game, football games? The people who are willing to conform. Flying on airplanes, to fly on an airplane, you know, you got to be x-rayed naked and you got to let your children's penises be touched by grown men and you got to take off your shoes. I don't fly on airplanes anymore. Who flies on airplanes? People who conform, right? When the buses are controlled by Google and there's facial recognition and the bus is monitoring your social network and stuff, who gets on the bus and doesn't get on the bus will be controlled by technology. Who's going to get on the bus? The people who conform. And of course, the other big problem with the... <clears throat> had to get that out of my throat. The other... <laughs> Obama's dick was trying to go down my throat. I don't do that like you status do. I had to choke that puppy out. The other big problem with this is, of course, the way the internet takes the place of any kind of meaningful dialogue, any kind of meaningful action, any kind of meaningful change. For example, they talked about the Vietnam War, people burning their draft cards. Well, now, nobody would burn a draft card because that would require you to leave your house. 
and that would require you to have a draft card and require you to light it on fire and oh my god it's fire it's scary right who's gonna protect me from the fire the government should make a law against people burning things in public because it's dangerous so what you'll do is you'll go on Facebook and you'll just like a group that says I'm against the war and that's the last you'll ever do of it the internet and social media make any kind of social or political dissent essentially meaningless because it's reduced to nothing. You're not doing anything. People who are against, let's pretend for a minute that anybody was against the war because you can look around and the Republicans have never been against the war and all the Democrats who were against the war when Bush was president now fucking love the war in Afghanistan because their messiah Hussein Obama is president. I mean, so the the the, the anti-war protest, such as it is, is pretty much just happening online now. If anywhere, there's a few websites against it, but there's nobody out doing. There's nothing visible because normal people, again, normal people don't get on the internet and go, oh, I'm gonna go look and check out the anti-war protesters and let them on my computer and spend time looking at their website. No, the way as a society you become exposed to, for example, anti-war protesters or anti-segregation protesters is by seeing these people in real life on the corners, on the streets, in front of the city hall. When protest activity, when social political activism is confined only to the internet, nobody sees it except the people who go looking for it. And nobody fucking goes looking for it. Right? I know you think that your fucking Greenpeace Save the Rainforest website is popular, but it's only popular with the choir. It's only popular with people who already believe the shit you believe. Right? Nobody is stumbling across that and having a moment of revelation the way people would stumble across people burning draft cards or people protesting outside City Hall or Rosa Parks saying, fuck no, I'm not going to get out of this seat, kiss my black ass. Or people you know, being inconvenienced by Martin Luther King Jr. walking down the street with a bunch of people following him, okay? When you take all of that activism and all of that movement and all of that gearage towards social change and you take it out of the real world and you put it on the fucking internet, you've made yourself completely irrelevant because on the internet, Nobody gives a fuck about your stupid opinion. If you want to change the world, you have to do it in the context of the real world.